We're going to dissect the body language of Michael Bever as he's being interrogated. He and his brother killed his family. And Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, this is a great interrogation. Those of you who like the interrogation room are going to really appreciate it. Michael and his brother, Robert, are serving life sentences for the murder of five family members. Um, Michael was 16, that you'll see in here, and Robert was 18. These guys killed their family between 1140 and 1220, and a short time later were captured in the woods behind the house, and this interrogation occurs within hours. Prescription medications? Well, man, I'm... You know, I just kind of got thrown into this, so I was hoping maybe you could kind of just go back at the beginning when all this started and kind of tell me what happened, because I need I need kind of the details so we know and understand what, what you went through and stuff. Okay, so I'm the very start. Mm -hmm. Okay, about like uh, two months ago. Okay. That's when we first uh, really started talking. So when you it. say we, who are you talking about? Me and my brother who is also. Your was, brother? Yeah, who's he has to do with me? And what's his name? Uh, Robert. Robert? Okay. And how old is he? Uh, 18. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, a couple months ago, I think it got to the start of this year, we started talking about uh, Bojo and Rampage and stuff like that. Okay. And I didn't take it seriously at first, but then he started buying like a body armor and stuff. Where did he buy body armor from? eBay and Amazon. Oh, okay. Definitely. Yeah, legal. Does yeah. he have a job? He did it at my tech, he quit, so there you go. Um, and uh, basically, it just kept escalating, he kept getting burned, and he asked if I went to me, and I said yes, so he got me my own set. Oh, okay. And then, about a month, about like June 30th, is when he came to me and said he found out that he can legally buy guns without permit in Oklahoma, that he could. Okay. And uh, that's when he started planning, and um... Uh, all right, Greg, what do you got? So I usually talk about micro cultures as being something very finite, like two people. And I started talking about that 20 years ago or so when I wrote a book and I talked about micro cultures all the way to macro culture. We're going to talk about two micro cultures in today's, in today's um, show because we're going to talk about a micro culture between these two dirtbag kids that kill their family who fed each other and fed each other and fed each other and turned into something horrible and an emerging micro culture between the interrogator and the source, the prisoner. And it has to be a microculture because you have to build enough rapport to transfer information. This guy is going to do a great job. We're going to start watching him. He just finished the intake process, meaning he's done all of his paperwork, signed all of his release. And now this detective does the a classic. I'm new. You're going to have to help me out. Watch this kid. His respiration increases immediately. And Chase, you're always talking. I think it's hard for people sometimes to envision that when you're talking about breathing in your stomach, your whole body is opening up. As you get more and more apprehensive, your rib cage gets to be a, an iron cage that prevents you from breathing as your diaphragm rises higher. And that's due to fight or flight. And we'll see it happen. And what you then are doing is breathing in the tops of your lungs only. And you'll hear him occasionally go, because he's got to push all that CO2 out so he can breathe again. And it's really cool to watch because you get a really good job of it. One of my favorite things we've heard in any interrogation ever is when this kid says we. He does interrogator 101. When you say we, what do you mean? Don't leave anything on the table. This guy does a great job. And you watch, this kid does a sudden arm change when he feels threatened. That's not the comfortable, relaxed arms across your body. That is a very, very sudden change. Anytime you got change, we know there's something going on. He taught, we, we're not talking about an absolute that when somebody crosses their body like this, it means that they're locking you out. But when they, they suddenly do it under duress or under questioning, then you find out. Listen to his words. I'm always a fan of source leads. What he emphasizes is stuff, stuff. Listen, we're going to hear it over and over and over, and those are going to be keys to his story. You could poke and say, did the body armor get you in? And give him a, give him an opportunity. He also says, my own set. He's Everything he's pointing out are things that are important to him. And you can see him also doing some, when, when he started talking about planning, you can see his adapting, you know, he's t touching his face, and then the expression in his face goes to disapproval or distaste. And you just watch him because he does a whole lot of barrier. He's going to change things. He says suddenly doing and uh, and then he his barriers increase. He starts to adapt. His word patterns shift. This guy's going to be cleanly aware of this because he's doing something I call cold source leading. Every one of those things he's making note of mentally. You can watch him and maybe even writing it down so that he can come back to it later. Scott, what do you got? 
All right. Yeah. This is the perfect placement of a suspect and interrogator. They're not across the table from each other. The detective isn't too close. He's not too far away. He's just a little bit out of range of touching, but I'm sure the kid's leg is close enough where he could pat him on the leg if he needs to. But if he needs to, he'll work toward that and get over there when it, when it comes time to close if that moment arrives. And I think it's a great opening. Like you were saying, Greg, it bummed me out because you got the stuff part. He said, I just got thrown into this. We, I need to know what you went through and what you went through and stuff. He's saying, I need to know what you went through. He's identified, trying to identify with this kid and get him to, to identify with him. He's, he's going to start matching and mirroring to a high level here in a couple of minutes. And he gets rapport right out of the gate with this kid. So he, he and he approaches this thing like a conversation. And he slides into the matching and mirroring with his voice tone, his cadence, his the, the words he's using, obviously his vernacular, and, and his um, volume, how loud he's talking. So we'll watch this develop, and he'll almost morph into a mirror of this kid as he goes through. This is how you should do it. It's the best example I've ever seen of somebody who, who instantly bego- begins matching and mirroring someone else. Everybody says, oh, it's all about mirroring. The matching part is when you start sounding like that person. You start using the same vernacular they're using. You use the volume, the cadence, same thing. You match all of those things, and you mirror their body language. That's the key. When you get bo- both of those together, you create rapport instantly when that happens. It's And it's a powerful, potent tool. This is the, this is the I think that's the best we've, we've seen on here so far, of somebody instantly getting in, Getting that kid's attention because you're right, Greg. The, the, he he gets worked up. He start, but which he would be in that case if he's not a psychopath. So that that's one cue. We see an emotion there. We see emotion. It's stress. So we can we can add to that. But still, it looks to me like an emotional stress in there. He's stressed because of what he's been through, and then for for what's happening to him now. I don't think he's worried about what's happened. But we'll talk about that uh, more in a few minutes. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with y'all. This is one of the probably I would say top one percent interrogators that we've ever mm. seen, and I say that not because of the what he's eliciting from the suspect. I don't go off of the behavior of the suspect. I'm going off of just his behavior and how he's conducting the interview. So uh, having a suspect willing to walk in there and just talk about everything uh, doesn't make you a good interrogator. How you behave does, and we're seeing that here very very good. And one thing that I teach in interrogation is very early in the conversation, you want that person to start responding to incomplete sentences. So an example of this, the interrogator could have said, and by we, you mean, and just leave it off. Them completing incomplete sentences is a rapid rapport builder as well, as well and it helps them to be more open He's at 90 degrees, which is a great angle to be at. Like Scott, Greg, you all covered that. And he makes that admission. I just got thrown into this. An admission of naivete, lacking knowledge, makes it easier to ask questions and separates himself from the investigators who are working on this, who are like really filled in on the case. Orange juice on the table is probably a bad idea. You can see that there's like some orange juice on the table there. There's several studies that show having somebody in an interrogation room uh, in what's called a glucose deficit makes them extremely more suggestible and likely to tell the truth or to confess. And hopefully those are the same things. And in the study, they call this a measure of interrogative suggestibility. And glucose deficit plays a huge part in that. So these are called baseline questions. They serve three functions. I want to enhance compliance, number one. I'm getting them to comply. I ask, you answer. They build rapport, number two. And number three, it's an opportunity to measure some baseline. So his baseline here is calm, is controlled, and his gestures on the table as he's talking. I'm talking about the kid here, which we all call illustrators. And their time to his speech His breathing rate is already up. It's into his chest, so it might be hard to include that in some future analysis, but we'll continue to keep looking at it. His blink rate's pretty normal, so we know this will be a good indicator if we see it spike in the future. And his crossing his arms is a change, but I haven't seen the whole video. I'm just seeing him do this in one video. It's not a big enough change for me just looking at this one video to mean anything whatsoever. Uh, So it could be freezing cold in the room. 
or this could be some baseline thing that he does. If you see arm, arm crossing, always look at the hands, which we see here are relaxed and very natural with, with the arm cross. That's all I got. Mark. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> oh, yeah, Mark. <laughs> no problem. What do you say? Uh, listen, Chase, uh, if, if the orange juice uh, is going to improve his gluc glucose, I don't think it's got round to his hands yet because they are pretty flaccid at the moment. There's no big line of energy. Now, we will later on see those hands, those arms become more, shall we say, turgid, but at the moment they're really flaccid. Uh, and they're asymmetrical as well, which means one hand is, I said the word flaccid, and Scott's already gone. Can't, can't help himself. He's thinking of something. I don't know what yeah, he's thinking of. It's the other word. It's the other word it, that got me. But it, <laughs> but it might be rude. I don't know. So, so yeah, there we go. It is rude. Um, so look, he's he's asymmetrical, and so and so that could mean uh, there's a conflict going on. We'll see him be more symmetrical uh, and more actioned with his gestures later on. So that's worth uh, remembering. Um, High, high breathing, yes, and lots of big out-breath, which suggests to me he's going to run out of oxygen very, very soon. He's trying to deal with the carbon dioxide that's building up from that fight and flight, doing big out-breaths, but no big in-breaths at the belly. So he's going to run, run out of oxygen at some point. So at the moment, there's a conflict. He's asymmetrical. His gestures are... Uh, soft and flaccid, which means that he's lacking in energy. So is this deceit? Well, no, it's probably more likely defeat at this point. He's already straight into this uh, situation, and he already seems to me relatively defeated by what's going on. And why wouldn't he be? It's, it's, it probably looked fairly bad for him out of the scene, I would imagine. Uh, so, and there's probably getting no way getting past that and we'll see how this interview, this interrogation uh, kind of lines up as we go along and exactly what these people are looking for, which is not necessarily, did he do it, but how many did he do? Is, is probably the case. Greg, what are your thoughts? Mark, I think he had an encounter with Rin 1010 on the way as well. So I don't think that probably made him any more relaxed encountering a police dog. Right, right. And it's that way he's got the uh, the medical, he's had some medical attention. Not maybe. sure, but he talks about the dog in the interview. So, yeah. Oh, okay. It, it was a, a big significance to him. Is it yeah, yeah, right on, Greg? Maybe the dog, did the dog go for his, go for his chase? Where would the dog go for? Elbow, arm? Anything that's close to its yeah. face. Whatever's <laughs> dangling, right? <laughs> yeah. right? Greg okay. said it was his right arm. I so, did. Okay. It's his right arm. Let's see okay. what that does. <laughs> <laughs> Prescription medications? Well, man, I'm, you know, I just kind of got thrown into this, so I was hoping maybe you could kind of just go back at the beginning when all this started and kind of tell me what happened, because I need, I need kind of the details so we know and understand what, what you went through and stuff. Okay, so I'm the very start. Mm -hmm. Okay, about like uh, two months ago. Okay. That's when we first... I uh, really stopped talking. So when you say we, who are you talking about? Me and my brother who is also... You're a brother? Yeah, who's he has been there. And what's his name? Uh, Robert Pepper. Robert? Okay. And how old is he? Uh, 18. Okay. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, a couple months ago, I think we got to the start this year, we started talking about uh, road ruin, run of and stuff like that. Okay. And I didn't take it seriously at first, but then he started buying, like, a body armor and stuff. Where did he buy body armor from? eBay and Amazon. Oh, okay. Yeah, legal. Does yeah. he have a job? He did at my tech he quit, so there you go. Um, and you know, basically, it just kept escalating, he kept getting burned, and he asked if I went in, and I said yes, so he got me my own set. Oh, okay. And then, about a month, about like June 30th, is when he came to me and said, found out that he can legally buy guns without permit in Oklahoma that he could. Okay. And uh, that's when he started planning. And, um... So let's go back real quick. Um, we're talking about the ammunition being delivered, uh, making plans. Tell me more about making plans and what you guys talked about. Making plans, we all plotted every night, and I started realizing we were actually going to do this thing on the second night. And so I started getting ready. When was that? You said the second night, what do you mean? July 1st. Okay. 
Because we started shooting the movies. That's when you started making the plan? Yeah, that's when we found out you could buy guns legally. I see. Did you guys draw, make drawings or write things down? Or? I think he had a journal. He basically had okay. his down. I think it's under his bed. Under his I bed. Don't check there. Is it like a like, like, like a journal, like a notepad, or yeah, a book? Yeah, it's like a it's like a blank book. Okay, a black book. I think it's like a little case. Or so you think he wrote stuff in there? Yeah, I think he was planning it. Hmm. Um. So then the second day, you said that's when you realized that. It might actually happen. Yep. What made you realize that? Um, how serious he was. I mean, he was going through. He started. Um, he started planning on taking all of his money out of his uh, bank and throwing away stuff, throwing mm -hmm. away all this stuff. So you know. Why did he want to do that? To that kill people. Yeah. Um. Well, t mainly two reasons. I think it's um because he just like says he hates. Everyone he thinks society is pointless, and so he wanted to kill people. No, no, and also, he wanted to like beat, um, beat the kill, like amount of other famous people like Colin Bond and uh, James Egan Holmes. Okay. Did you kind of feel that way too? Like when you guys were talking earlier, like yeah, I, it, like do you have a problem with society too? Do you think? No, no I just. Or you were just more like the the number of people getting killed was kind of interesting and yeah, exciting. Yeah. Okay. So, because um, you mentioned a couple names of are those like serial killers or something? Well, like Columbine. Yeah. Uh, Columbine and James Egan Holmes. James Egan Holmes is a guy that shot at the theater in Colorado. Yeah, he killed twelve in so. Wow. How many were killed in Columbine? Columbine, I don't know, like fifteen. Okay. I think. Um, so. All right, Chase, what do you got? So he's, you'll see him picking at this bandage that's around his arm. That stuff is called Coflex. Uh, it's pretty normal for people to do. He may have gotten his blood drawn on the way in to see if he was under the influence. That looks like what that is. It's not really, it doesn't look like enough to be a bandage. Uh, I don't know. But is suggesting, very gently suggesting that the older brother is the mastermind here. The detective is helping him to do that. And he refers to the other murderers as famous. He doesn't call them famous murderers or anything else. It's just famous. They're famous people, which is super weird. And they were made famous by the society that he just said is useless. So there's a bit of irony here which I hope Mark will talk about. Because Mark, when he talks about irony, there's Disney movies coming in. There's The Hobbit. You never know. You never know what you're going to hear. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> so this is one of the best interrogators I've seen in a very long time. I don't say this based on the person, uh, the suspect, but his composure and the way that he's so brilliant on the basics. He's brilliant at the basics of interrogation. Uh, and if you're watching this, we'd love to have you on the show with us to, to chat about this if you'd like. We're seeing pretty open behavior, and we're seeing him grab onto suggestions that the interrogator is putting forth to subtly suggest this was wholly somebody else's idea and somebody else's planning. Listen to the softening words the interrogator is using, like maybe and kind of, sort of, just. All of those are softening words to help him bite down onto this idea. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. And I, th I thought it was a, a more of a, a bandage situation because when you get your blood drawn, isn't the, the little thing thinner than that? So I get mine done, and yes. it's like the little thin thing. At a lab, that, they use thin ones, but hospitals carry the thicker Coflex oh, okay. a, lot, a lot more. Okay. All right. I don't, I don't know. All right. Well, the kid adapts um, as the and the interrogator adapts, and the kid's already following him. He's he's following the interrogator when he did, when he moves the kid moves and he does those things. And that's the very first thing we see coming into this one, and you don't have to keep in mind when you're you're mirroring somebody and you're matching someone, you don't have to do the exact same thing. And you'll notice that a lot because when the kid gets stressed, sometimes he'll squeeze his hand real big and the guy will go to his face or he'll he'll rub right here to show the kid he's stressed to put that in the, in his head because he's trying to make him feel like he feels like the kid feels. And that's really important here. Uh, and he's trying to get him to open up. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that work very well here. This is, I think, this is a textbook example, actually, of matching and mirroring. They both got their arm, arm on the table when, when the kid puts his on, or the cop puts his on, or the detective puts his on. 
and their arms crossed in front of him. Beautiful execution on all that. Then after this, he'll move to mirroring his breathing because the kid's breathing gets a little bit odd in there. And, and you'll watch the detective, his does too. When the kid sighs real big, he'll sigh too. And then he'll put his hand to his face and do that. He's showing him that he feels the same stress he's show, that he's feeling. Now, this may not seem important, but he's executing perfectly one of the most potent tools you can possibly do. Mark talks about the breathing in and out and matching the, the, the breathing as well all the time. Because that will, when someone is in the hospital and a doctor wants to try to calm them down, the doctor will start, you know, the, the guys who know about it or women who know about it, they'll start breathing at the same rate the patient's breathing. And that helps you calm down. I don't know why that is, but that's what happens. Um, but I've done the, the, the things this guy's doing. He's talking to him, trying to act like him, those things. I've done this before with a, with a, a kid I was talking to, and this this works because I think this kid may not have had a father figure that was uh, cool with him or nice to him. So he needs that. So he needs an older person tell him that he's you know talking to him in the fashion he is. I'll get into details later on as we go through this. Just get the kid starts scratching his eye and rubs his eye, and the a detective does the same thing. It's not the exact same thing, but he gets really close and does it. So that's that's really important. And you start hearing that rhythm as they talk back and forth. It's really easy to talk to someone, and you'll talk for a minute, and then there'll be that little pause, and then they'll say something, and you'll talk right back. He's waiting to get that rhythm going, so it's almost like a ping-pong thing going back and forth. So he's matching him with with his vernacular and his words and his tone and his cadence, and he's mirroring his body language. He's mirroring his breathing. And he's got that ping pong with the conversation going back and forth. It's real. And he may not even know he's doing this. That's the thing about it. He may be so good, he may not even realize that's what he's doing, but he's connecting with that kid. And that's why we're going to hear this the kid start talking and talking and talking. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so talking of micro, microcultures, Greg, uh, there are times when I just can't work out what this subject is saying. I don't understand the microculture oh. of the, of, but I did pick up this thing. It's like a blank book. And he then becomes very energized in symmetry with his gestures. And he also illustrates that book. He shows us the, the book, essentially. And I think he tells us it's under the, under the bed. I could be wrong because I find it sometimes very hard to work out what he's saying. But it's interesting because suddenly his gestures stop being flaccid. They start to become energized. They go into symmetry. He illustrates or kind of mimes for us perfectly this book. So very probably the book exists. Uh, he very probably it is under the bed and very probably even if the book doesn't exist, he wants us to think and know that a book exists because I think he wants to, wants to suggest there is some evidence out there that says he's not fully involved and somebody else is absolutely and most fully involved in this and he's seen an opportunity to really put that across and illustrate that so that for me is a massive difference from how he started out which was asymmetrical and these kind of floppy gestures this defeat suddenly becomes something um more more of a celebration now um you know, it's interesting that he t talks about uh, essentially the, the interviewer here for me feeds him the idea of that it's not about society. It's about numbers. Now, I don't know whether there's been some conversation beforehand or some information around that this isn't about a social grudge of any sort. Um, uh, but the interviewer seems to be putting this feed the idea to him that it's not about society. It's about the numbers. It's interesting that the society, the grudge against society, would would be more kind of tropic of 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 sociopathic or even psychopathic. You, you imagine those extreme, uh, you know, cartoon versions of the psychopath. They've got some, you know, massive crazy grudge against against society. You know, at the moment, everybody's trying to move away from that and go. It's just kind of a numbers game. You just want to get either status around that or, you know, uh, you like counting numbers, you like collecting uh, things. Interesting, interesting idea. Let's see where that uh, goes into. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Did I go? Oh, maybe you did. Greg. Uh, Scott? No? no? Greg? Greg? One more. <laughs> yeah, there it is. No, Greg. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, with yeah, so, disaster, isn't it? Mark, you hit. I'm going to go to the very last thing I have here first and then go backward because you said something that is key. 
many years ago when I was dealing with people and interrogating, I, I remember one of the most interesting things I ever learned, a guy actually saying, well, if I killed a bunch of people and did something in terrorist activity, people will remember my name. If I just work the rest of my life, they won't. That's a different mindset and a different way of being, killing 50 people, putting you at the beginning. And you have to be able to get into that psyche to be able to talk to that guy. Now, let's back up a minute. Because I look the way I look, because I have a blank stare, people probably think I'm an aggressive all the time interrogator. Not true at all. Actually, I'm the other way. I believe that you have to get the person calmed down enough to be able to build rapport so that you can actually do what we do. The skill set of terrifying somebody is, is the captor's job, not mine. My job is to do something else. Now, if I'm captor, different story. And I've captured a lot of people in my life over doing things, both in real war and in training. And the training, trust me, you wouldn't think it was training the way it was carried out. So I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people react. One of the things we know is that when a person's brain is consumed by terror and fear, number one, they can't remember. Number two, they're going to say whatever you want to hear. And number three, nothing is reliable. So it's a waste of time at that moment. The other interesting thing is the human brain prioritizes input and stimulus when it's in terror. One of the best things we know is this kid is not in terror now. This guy has managed through what he's done to calm him just a bit so he can start building rapport. And you know how you know that? He's playing with that bandage. He wouldn't, he wouldn't notice that bandage on his arm if he were in sheer terror because it's not a threat. And a great example, one of the things when you're captured, often people don't realize their bladder is full until 15 minutes after they're captured and then they start begging for the bathroom. You know that their fight or flight is starting to tone down and you can go over and talk to them then. And you can start to get some control. You're also giving them relief. So there's a lot of things that go into play here. Watch this kid. This guy's been so good that this kid becomes non-confrontational and, and non judgment He can see he's non-judgmental, so he opens up. Look at his body language, Mark. Exactly what you said. He asked him a question about a book. He accesses over, hey, he's remembering this book. Then he starts defining the book with his hands. And I think this kid is opening up because he thinks now he doesn't yet feel any connection to this guy so that he feels like he's embarrassed to tell him what he did. That's a beautiful place to be. Once you get to a point where the person's embarrassed, now you lose some ability to get information out of him. He's not there yet. He still feels like it's okay to talk this way. We'll watch that change through these videos. When he's doing this, it's likely his first idea of awareness of what's going on, and he's comforting himself. We all said that. And I agree with you, Chase. It could be COVID. I mean, I'm co-banned over a, um, over a piece of gauze. It could be, could have scraped his elbow. Who knows? But I do agree with you. It's, it's some co-banned stuff. He does stuff, stuff again. So he's emphasizing stuff when he says something, which probably means that means something to him. We gave our stuff away. So the game is over. We're done. He does some, a, a emotional accessing and touches his face. Now this interrogation thing, as you start paying attention, you got get to see what a good interrogator does. He's trying to disarm the guy, bring him down to a comfort level, create enough rapport, the guy feels safe talking to him and just wait and watch what he does to him later. This is, this is the easy part, waiting for him to calm in, but knowing when and how to talk to the kid so the kid starts to feel you and you can say, hey, man, I get it. I, it's better to do this than sit in your house and nobody know who you are. And you can see he's not judging. He's doing all that other stuff that you guys are talking about. I agree with you guys 100%. And the last thing you see is this kid. I work with New Yorkers all the time. And New Yorkers will have a tendency to talk at the same time. Pretty common. This kid's doing that with nonverbals. He's going and confirming the guy's question before the guy finishes. Chase, exactly to your point, he's being trained how to respond and he's doing it quickly. So let's go back real quick. Um... We're talking about the ammunition being delivered, uh, making plans. Tell me more about making plans and what you guys talked about. Making plans, we all plotted every night, and I started realizing we were actually going to do this thing on the second night, and so I started getting ready. When was that? You said the second night, what do you mean? July 1st. Okay. Because we started June 30th. That's when you started making the plan? Yeah, that's when we found out you could buy a gun sleep. I see. Did you guys draw, make drawings or write things down? Or? I think he had a journal. Basically, I think he's had a news down. I think it's under his bed. Under his I bed. Check that out. Is it like a like, like, like a journal? Like a notepad? Or yeah. Like a book? It's like a it's like a blank book. Okay. A black book. I think it's like a little case. Or so you think he wrote stuff in there? Yeah. I think he was planning it. Hmm. Um. So then the second day, you said that's when you realized that. It might actually happen. Yeah. What made you realize that? 
um, how serious he was. I mean, he was going through. He started. Um, he started planning on taking all of his money out of his uh, bank and throwing away stuff, throwing away all this stuff. So you know. Why did he want to do that? Do that kill people? Yeah. Um. Well, t- mainly two reasons I think. It's um because he just like says he hates. Everyone he thinks society is pointless and so he wanted to kill people. No, no, and no. also he wanted to like beat um, beat the kill like amount of other famous people like Colin Bond and uh, James Egan Holmes. Okay. Did you kinda of feel that way too, like when you guys were talking earlier, like Yeah. I, it, like do you have a problem with society too, you think? No, no I just or you were just more like the the number of people getting killed was kind of interesting and yeah, exciting. Yeah. Okay. So, because um, you mentioned a couple names of are those like serial killers or something? Well, like Columbine. Yeah. Uh, Columbine and James Egan Holmes. James Egan Holmes is a guy that shot at the theater in Colorado. Yeah, he killed twelve in Colorado. Wow. How many were killed, killed in Columbine? Columbine, I don't know, like fifteen. Okay. I think. Um, so, okay, so then kind of what happened is, I mean, you guys started getting all that stuff together and yeah. you're throwing things away. And yeah, and we knew that all the packages and the holsters, alibis, all that stuff was going to get healthy on. And so we set a date. So was the plan um, to use the knives at first on yeah. the family? Because the guns weren't going to be here till later on? Yeah, and the guns would be too loud. Oh, I see. So, um, going to use the knives on the family, which obviously mm-hmm. did not go as planned. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Um, oh, I just saw the red swords why not? Like, we yeah. didn't put more people out of it. Yeah. <sighs> did, um, so then you picked a date, you said? Yeah, which was yesterday. Yesterday night, it was the date. Did you pick a time and everything? Yeah, yeah, midnight when we were sitting, we said you in bed, except for mom. So how did you guys know? He just came and got you, or you got him, or what did you we, we, we were hanging out, yeah, that's good waiting. Okay, and so... How did you pick the date? Um, we were involved in you know, the packages and stuff would be out, because, you know, all the ammunition, he didn't want them to see that. So we killed him the day before the ammunition would get out, the day after we didn't leave. Do you guys, um, do you guys not like your mom and dad? I mean, is there, what are they... I mean, I'm, most teenagers don't like their parents, so I can understand that. Yeah, I mean, mom's okay, but dad was a little bit, you know. Just a little bit too much. Yes. So, you guys wait in the room, mm-hmm. and was it right when midnight, and that's when things started? Right at midnight, um, my sister, uh, she came in, because she was going to get to go to bed, she came in to tell us. How um, old was I? 13. Okay. She came in to tell us. They had one this kid's kitchen done before we went to bed and put the cats up. And basically, we did what we planned. I tried, I, uh, I, you know, to my desk. And I, like, had to look at something to this guy to go up or went up behind to grab to him and slip with you. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, here's another emphatic a- exhale when he says, set a date. He's very emphatic about it. I think this is part of their whole plan. But he's when you listen to him when he's talking about the people, there's no emotion at all, no emotional eye accessing, nothing. I don't think we're seeing any feeling for these people. He shows stress, all that eye rubbing. There, there doesn't appear to be any remorse, sadness, or anything about how he's perceived in this room yet. We'll see that change. But right now, he's just talking like this is a video game. His chin's down. He's got restricted breathing. And then you start to see how Square's ribcage turns into as he starts to feel some kind of some kind of remorse in there. And when they ask the probably the best single piece of body language to now that I see in this entire thing is when they ask a question about parents, there is absolute contempt in this kid's face when he's talking about parents. And then the only, the only, in my opinion, emotional eye accessing we really see is when he's talking about his perception of them. And he also says something about his sister, and she came in to tell us. That's another aggressive thing pushed out of his mouth with a lot of strength. When I say a source lead, when you're talking to a criminal, a prisoner, 
an Intel source, and they bring up something with a lot of emphatic behavior. We call that a source lead because we know that needs to be exploited. And there are two kinds, hot and cold. A hot one means I go at it right now. A cold one means I put it off and bring it back up later. I would call that one a hot lead. I would ask a question, but he's good and masterful at not angering this guy. And I think either way would have worked. This kid is starting to bond to him now, and that's an important part. Chase, what you got? Yeah, so the, the behavior we're seeing throughout this is pretty abnormal. And from what I've been able to learn, uh, they dealt with extreme isolation and uh, potentially some abuse. They were kept inside. Uh, they lacked a lot of social skills and social connections with people in the real world. And at this age, boys are struggling hard with identity and impulsivity, and they have testosterone levels that are just through the roof. And we could also be seeing uh, what he sees as an authority in his older brother. And this was likely a factor no matter what else we see. And being psychologically vulnerable at that at that age with that state like that and not being connected, which could come from any number of disorders, abuse, neglect, and even genetic factors, it does one major huge thing to kids at this age. It makes them seek extreme solutions to simple problems. And this causes a lack of empathy and understanding that makes doing the crime like this a lot easier. I'm not going to comment on the clip here. I heard some... Uh, negative stuff being discussed in it while we were watching it this morning, so I didn't didn't do that. But I will say, I'm not really sure why people get so obsessed with the, our culture is, anyway, is obsessed with the checklist and diagnoses. And if we're witnessing psychopathic behavior, we can call it psychopathic behavior because it is psychopathic behavior. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a weird trend in our culture where we need to find labels and checklists uh, as if it as if all of us fit into some kind of Excel spreadsheet somewhere. People are all different. And I think it's a critical oversight that really undermines our understanding of psychopathy. And it favors uh, yeah. this sim simplistic, flawed labeling system that gives us a placebo of feeling like we understand something about the messy truth of just human life in general. The psychopath checklist is a model. And as Mark says, all the time, all models are useful or all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, so, uh, Greg, to your stuff. Yes, you're absolutely right. We then get data and we also get planned and us. And so, you know, it's interesting how we're getting a lot of stress there around some of these mundane things of of what and where and when. We are getting some people, but the people tend to be us. And uh, so, so things, events, not so much people and feelings. And so we could, you know, we could put that on a continuous spectrum of neurotype and, and, and behavior, uh, along with actually those... Uh, phonic stresses that we're getting. Not that there's that I've seen a study on this, but as a, a data point of, of, I'd say, five on my part, seeing in a certain neurotype that stressing on certain phonemes where, where usually you wouldn't get those stresses there. So that's just of interest to me. I'm making no, absolutely no diagnosis or prediction around that. Just for me, I went, hmm, heard that, heard that stress somewhere before uh anyway intro just as you say chase it's 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 messy it's muddy it's real life uh it's not film or tv which isn't messy or muddy the great thing about film and tv is it's not a crossword puzzle you you should be able to get it right you sit down you watch it you get fed it and you go ah and i see what's happening here um i even dislike those kind of whodunit things because i'm like you just, just tell me who did it and let's get on with that. I, 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 I that's why, that's why Columbo is so good. They right, give it to you in the front and then yeah. work back. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. which is so different from real life where you don't know up front yeah. and you don't know during it. And you often, you get right to the end of it, real life, and you're like, what happened there? I have zero idea what went on, what went on there. And I think, you know, as I've said before, when when confronted with this not knowing, you go, you either you either you're either happy with that 
or you get really angry and upset that you don't know, or you make up a whole bunch of stories. And I think, you know, some of these models, Chase, are great stories for people to jump on top of and go, well, okay, let's put them in, in this box, this story of sociopath or psychopath or this or that, or, you know, whatever you want to, whatever you want to bundle people into. Look, nothing wrong with that. Just so long as you go, okay, it's possible, it's probable. Um, uh, Anyway, everybody uh, wants a simple checklist for a monster, though. That's just yeah. yeah. And yeah. I I agree with you. And the thing is, like you were saying, Chase, they'll see this guy and think automatically right out of the gate. How well? How could you do that if you weren't a psychopath? That's the thing. You, it sometimes it takes a year to diagnose somebody being a, a, a true psychopath, a clinical psychopath. So you can't just call it out of the gate. That's that's a. I'm glad, so glad you said that because it gets on my no last nerve. Right. No, there's no need. No. To. He's a killer. Doesn't matter yeah. what brand the killer yeah. is. He killed his family. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of Columbo, speaking of Columbo, life. the other day when I was coming back from our, when we come back from Dallas, right? And I've told Greg this already. So anyway, this woman sat next to me. She's, She's from funny. Phoenix. Denise. Hi, Denise. I know you're watching because we talked about this. Den Denise and I talked for a while and I really wanted to watch Columbo, right? Because I downloaded that from, uh, that that channel um watch it for days it's all these colombo episodes and this girl goes through and she tells you all who all the actors are what was going on in peter falk's life at the time all the it's fantastic and i watch all of them so i finally got to where i could disengage from the conversation i had my ipad up got it out and so i saw a lot of movement over here with her and we're getting really close and it's getting really bumpy really bumpy and it wasn't the bump, the roughest I've been on. We've all been on those planes that, that everybody else gets horrified and we don't. And they're like, well, aren't you scared? You're like, is this thing going to crash? The odds are in our favor. So anyway, you know, they, I'm sure they said, you know, um, when I saw everybody putting their things up, so I always put my iPad down and I put it down near my lap and I flip it back up so I can watch it and continue watching whatever I'm watching on that guy. So we land, right? And I'm sitting there watching Columbo. And as we land... I catch out of the corner of my eye. She's still moving around a lot. And she starts doing this Catholic cross thing, right? And I'm like, so I take off my headphones. I'm like, darling, what, what's going on with you? What, what's happening? She goes, the engine. I'm, I'm just glad the engine worked. And I'm like, yeah, you know, why You know, why wouldn't the engine work? You know, obviously, these planes are great. You know, they're built to, to you know, take off land and go through a lot of stuff, storms. She said, did you not hear what the pilot said? I said, what are you talking about? She said, you didn't hear that. I said, no, I didn't hear it. What are you saying? She said, our engine wasn't working. We had one coming in. I said, what are you talking about? And I looked around. Everybody else was like crying and holding things and talking and praying and all kinds of stuff. I looked out the window and the ambulances, the fire trucks, all that stuff's out there. And we're just sitting there waiting. Can so I ask uh, uh, Boeing? Boeing or Airbus? No, it was Airbus. <laughs> All right. So you know why you know why that happened, Scott? Because you're talking no. smack about helicopters just before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. right. That could have been, could have been. But I went through that whole thing at the at the luggage thing. People were hugging. They'd met friends for life and all that, you know. So yeah, I missed the whole thing watching Colombo. Chase, it's not that you and I are saying that Boeing have bad aircraft. I mean, I would oh, yeah, just be like careful. To say, I just no. I, that's why I would just like to say yeah. that I think Boeing have have very good aircraft and i'm Same. always very happy to uh to uh and, and I, I've, I've i've got my don't shoot me boeing card as well so i'm, I'm okay <laughs> good. just so everybody knows I'm, I'm okay we, we should do that video I'm of the guy the doesn't get shot the guy who yeah who yes. yes. suicided yeah yes yes Maybe that's that would be interesting yeah so that, could, so that we can back up that it was nothing to do with boeing there you go we'll, do, we'll, we'll put that one up We'll get, we'll get a video yeah, this week. They were involved in any way. Okay. So then kind of what happened is, I mean, you guys started getting all that stuff together and yeah. kind of throwing things away. And yeah, and we knew we that all the packages and the holsters, alibis, all that stuff was going to get out from Amazon. And so we set a date. So was the plan um, to use the knives at first? On yeah. the family, because the guns weren't going to be here till later on. Yeah, and the guns would be too loud. Oh, I see. So, um, go ahead and use the knives on the family, which obviously mm -hmm. did not go as planned. Yeah, thank God. Yeah. Um, oh, I just saw the red swords. Why not? Like we didn't put more people. I didn't. 
Yeah. Did, um, so then you picked a date, you said. Yeah, which was yesterday, yesterday night, it was the date. Did you pick a time and everything? Yeah, yeah, midnight, when we said, we said you wanted some daddy, so come on. So how did you guys know? He just came and got you, or you got him, or what did you we guys were, do? We were hanging out, yeah, that's good waiting. Okay, and so... How did you pick the date? Um, it would be involved in you know, the packages and stuff would be out. Because, you know, all the ammunition, he didn't want them to see that. So we killed him the day before the ammunition would get out, the day after we didn't leave. Do you guys, um, do you guys not like your mom and dad? I mean, is there, what are they... I mean, I'm, most teenagers don't like their parents, so I can understand that. Yeah, I mean, mom's okay, but dad was a little bit, you know. Just a little bit too much. Yes. So, you guys wait in the room, mm -hmm. and was it right when midnight, and that's when things started? Right at midnight, um, my sister, uh, she came in, because she was going to get to go to bed, she came in to tell us. How um, old was I was 13. Okay. She came in to tell us. They had one this kid's kitchen done before we went to bed and put the cats up. And basically, we did what we planned. I tried, I, uh, I got to my desk and I like, had to look at something to this guy to roll up and went up behind to grab to him and slip with you. I ran over and disabled the alarm. Okay. That's what I did. And then Where's ran, the, the pad for your alarm? It's not the to. It's what? It's now the front door. Near the front door? Yeah, and I'm, so I might have disabled the alarm, so it wouldn't, you know. But has she already gone outside? She went outside and then Robert went after her. So where, where is she? Uh, she she was playing the driveway and he took over her back from, um, you know, the bench, you know, if we got the hood, okay. and started choking her. Like and on the bench? Out yeah, front? Yeah, it was like a little bench, and he threw the bench on her and went back inside. To go after the little kids. Did he bring her in, it or did she stay out? There? She stayed out there until he asked me to be in her way. I went out. I had to go inside. That's why she was in the um in the against the way. I had to go come inside. So oh, she you brought her back. In. Yeah, was she was still alive. Yeah, she was still screaming. And then that's about the time Dad came down okay. because his bedroom's upstairs, and he went back in the police area where Robert was. Police area, that's what they call it, um, our room. Um. And they started attacking there. They got a whole, little bit of a fight, um, but then eventually, well, got him down, and um, I think he killed him. Did he cut his throat too? Um, where did that happen? In our room. In your room? Yeah. And uh, where were you? I was standing in the hallway. Okay. So did you see him cut your dad's throat? Yeah. Did he stab him other places too? I don't know. I think he just went for the throat. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, very simply, I find him casual and nonchalant in his behaviour around the killings. Yet at the same time, there's a lot of asymmetry. There's a lot of eye blocks. The lines of energy are broken. It's kind of, there's a sense of defeat. His breathing is high. There's some closure that happens around the mouth over areas. So my my guess would be at this point that he isn't happy about being in this in this um uh interview and and that seems to fit uh you know why would anybody be overjoyed and confident about being in this interview situation yet at the same time there isn't so much level of stress around the the killings casual nonchalant i find that you know a, a an interesting juxtaposition Though at the same time, not 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 odd that that it's a little bit messy around somebody who's clearly got so messy around a bunch of people. We couldn't expect. I mean, should we expect anything kind of deducible by this and ordinary around any of this? It would be interesting, wouldn't it, if you had if you had somebody who can go out to kill this many people, and we're like, yeah, that's very that's very ordinary behavior. That's very, uh, of course, you know, that's just what we do every day. Yeah, we should be seeing something which is probably difficult to explain a little bit more than a little bit muddy and a little bit odd. Seems muddy and odd to me, but why not? Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree. But let's let's talk about why you're seeing him act so calmly during this interview with the officer here. There's a few reasons that this could be happening. And I won't pretend that I know which ones are true and which are not. 
Uh, if this is psychopathy, forget about the checklist. Um, but we are seeing somebody who has a total absence of guilt and remorse. Second, if the shooting was planned for months or weeks, this experience of being arrested and interrogated was expected, planned on, and anticipated. So there's no fear because the future is certain. Fear comes from uncertain future. If you think about that, that's what happens there. And he's not trying to deceive anybody necessarily. He may be trying to minimize a bunch of stuff, but he's not making up a ton of lies and of fabricating an entire event. The third reason could be shock and dissociation. It could be going on. It's a psychological defense mechanism that helps people cope with uh, some seriously overwhelming emotions just by detaching or unplugging us from reality. So dissociation uh, manifests as outward calmness, even if the person is experiencing lots of internal stuff going on. That's all I got there. Yeah, Greg, what do you got? Yeah. Yeah. Great. I love both what you said. I agree 100 percent. And what we're seeing here, in my opinion, is, yes, you can dissociate from the actual killing and all that because you prepared for it and you know you got a box in your head for it. What I think he's having a hard time and Mark, what I think you're seeing is he's having a difficult time with the other part. Now he's starting to bond to this guy and he doesn't want to disappoint this guy. This guy may be a father figure. Who knows? I don't I can't speak to that part. But you can see, and I've been in many interrogations where a person's done something, and they'll tell you they've done it. But when it gets down to nitty gritty, they don't feel guilty about what they've done, but they don't want you disappointed with them. They don't want your judgment. And this guy's not been judgmental to now, and there may be part of that occurring. So that, for me, is really interesting because it means the bonding is taking place very effectively. And I think, Scott, you said it earlier, all that matching and mirroring has been powerful. Mm. And the kid is not being judged. And if he feels like he's not being judged, but there's potential to be judged, then that creates a, a kind of fear that will <clears throat> show itself here. So, for example, all this incongru incongruent movement and all that, Mark, that he's showing, I think that's what it's about. I don't think it's the other way. I think he doesn't care about what he's already done. And, and Chase, to your point, dissociation would give him the ability to compartmentalize that. But this stuff he can't because we see while he's got no emotion at all, you see that respiration increase. Like you would expect that the talking about killing your mother would do that, not the other way. And listen to him when he says about the mother. Uh, yeah, she was an entryway, almost like saying, hey, I left my bike in the rack in front of the school that casually. But he's certainly feeling some anxiety about something. Scott, what, what I was referring to is the dissociation from trauma oh. and, and dissociation being uh, a trauma response. Yeah, for sure. And that's what I'm saying is I agree with you. He, he, that dissociation is related to the actual act, but that doesn't protect him from this, from being afraid of letting somebody. So I agree with you 100 percent. I think he probably was all ready for that. And the dissociation compartmentalized and pushed that away. But he's not ready to disappoint this guy who has just been friendly to him. And I just those, mean that there's a potential for him to be in a dissociative state at, oh, for sure. at present. At present. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yep. Uh, Sorry, Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, so on the replay of this, when we go back and you subscribe, watch their hands and mouths. They do the exact same thing almost perfectly. They're met, they're matching and marrying each other perfectly. They're both rubbing their fingers at the same time, all that. Listen for that rhythm again for the, with the conversation going back and forth. You're seeing two people locked in. You're seeing this this interrogator is locked in with this kid, and it's beautiful. I, I I know I'm leaning hard on that, but it's it's fantastic what he's done here. It's so hard to do and do it well because you can't do it with everybody. You know, this kid's not trying to 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 go, come back on him. He's not trying to do anything. He's just puking up information everywhere, and that's why. Because once you're in it, you feel like you're building this relationship with this person. That's what happened. You feel like you're becoming friends with them. So you've got to trust them. You've got to tell them things. That's what he's done. That's what's going on here. So this kid's feeling like he's building a relationship. And and going back to what you were saying, Greg, and I'll talk about a little bit later on, he may not have had a figure uh, like that in his life he could he could bond with. And like you were saying earlier, Chase, as well, about someone being older and trying to connect with that person and and trying to make them proud of you or happy for you or or be happy with them. So he's identifying with him, and that's just one of the reasons, that, like I said earlier, that he's just puking up all this information because he doesn't feel the need to, to push back on it. He, I think he feels okay about it. But on the other hand, I don't think, I, from an emotional standpoint, I don't think he has anything in there to, to feel 
bad about or feel, you know, I don't think he feels bad. I don't think he's a psychopath, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's um, emotionally, I don't think he's coming across or giving up any emotions in this. So, but I do think he's trying to connect with this guy and, and that's why they're connecting so hard. I ran over with disabled the alarm. Okay. That's what I did. I didn't Where's the, the pad for your alarm? It's not the front door. It's what? It's now the front door. Near the front door? Yeah, and I'm, so I might have run disabled the alarm, so it wouldn't, you know. But has she already gone outside? She went outside and then went went after her. So where where is she? Uh, she she was playing the driveway and he took over her back from, you know, the bench, you know, if we got the road, okay. and started choking her. Like on the bench, out yeah, front? Yeah, it was like a little bench, and they threw the bench on them and went back inside to go after the little kids. Did he bring her in, or did she stay out there? She stayed out there until he asked me to be in her and I went out. I had to go inside, that's why she was in the yard. And they didn't get away, I had to go from inside. So oh, she you brought her back in? Yeah, she's she was still alive? Yeah, she was still screaming. And then that's about the time Dad came down. Okay. Because his bedroom's upstairs. And he went back in the police area where Robert was. The police area, that's what they call it, on our room. Um, and they started attacking there. They got a whole, little bit of a fight. Um, but then eventually, well, got him down and um, I think he killed him. Did he cut his throat too? Um, where did that happen? In our room. In your room? Yeah. And uh, where were you? I was standing in the hallway. Okay. So did you see him cut your dad's throat? Yeah. Did he stab him other places too? I don't know. I think he just went for the throat. You know, you guys had all these detailed plans. You had all the cool stuff to make it happen. Yeah. And it kind of started falling apart, and he said, like, it didn't go as planned. I think, I mean, did you kind of just freak out a little bit, like, yeah, this yeah. really happening? Well, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know it was going to be like. Yeah, you don't. But here's what's, here's what's getting me, is like, it's crazy because you guys worked together and made all these plans, and, you know, had it all figured out, and then when it happens, you're just kind of standing there not doing anything. And did you did you decide like Robert's gonna kill everybody and I'm gonna stand here and do nothing so I better I mean did you is Yeah that, I think I think that made my point I was I, I didn't want to kill anyone or put anyone I couldn't do it. So I was going to let him like kill everyone. Yeah, you stab somebody in the neck. No, I mean I just kinda of, Well what I'm saying is is it's not Robert's the one that should get all the credit here. I mean for I mean um yeah, well, because it's a big deal. I mean, you're going to be on the news. Um, you know what I mean? People are going to want to interview you. I don't want to be interviewed. this. Well, but I'm just thinking. He does. Because yeah. you had said you had the plans like you're supposed to kill this person. Yep. He's supposed to kill this person. Were you supposed to kill Christopher? Was he your responsibility? No. Um, it just worked out that way? Daniel and Daniel was supposed to be his responsibility. I was okay. supposed to kill Dad. And they to hold the future again. Yeah, but he had already basically done that. Yeah. So now you're left standing there. So were you trying to kill Christopher when you stabbed him in the neck? Were you just going to... I don't, I mean, I, I purposely missed the middle of the neck. I think I might have even hit him in the shoulder. I certainly didn't do it hard, but I don't know. Um, so, originally, your responsibility was Victoria. Victoria. And Dad. And Dad. Yep, that's who was supposed to take care of. Did you guys talk specific? Because you said you said the crossbow. So you said I mean you guys had it planned like this is specifically how we're gonna do it. Yeah, it was very specific, unfortunately, you know. Mm -hmm. I think he got his plan to move or something, it doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Well, it was supposed to be a lot quicker and quieter, I guess. I mean... All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, what I love about this is, uh, you know, as well as the uh, male interviewer is is doing here, I, I think he runs out of runway a little bit and you see him turn to the female interviewer and he has that look of, 
can you go now? You take over now. Yeah. She comes in with a question. He then regroup, gives him enough time just to regroup himself and he's back with a, with an idea or maybe just a little more confidence around the idea that he had. So, I mean, look, even when you've got somebody who, who looks to be doing so well at this, I mean, he's so casual with him. Um, he's so kind of calm. He's so engaged, so interested, uh, curious uh, uh, about this, but you see him run out after a while. Great that he's got somewhere with, with him. Easy handover, takes back over. Thought it was lovely to see that. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, this is a really good one because we do see him close up, but we see him close up at a certain time. And, and you know, you, we, I'm with you, Chase. We get to know whether it's cold or not in the room. And his hands are trapped, which usually you don't do if you're feeling really, really threatened. But I do think he's barriering. And the reason I think he's barriering is because we see his shoulders rise and get tighter as he goes into this whole conversation. When he first starts with this accusation, he had all this cool stuff and plans is when you see him cross. And I think he's uncertain where it's going. I think he gets okay with it. Because the detective then does something very simple. He says, did you kind of freak out? And you see the kid's brow like, yeah, yeah, I kind of freaked out, raised in, in recognition and a quick nod to agreement. Dete this detective has done a great job of getting real estate in this kid's head and even does up talk, kind of a positive thing. At, oh, no, you don't. That's usually not how it goes. So he's reinforcing that relationship and not condemning. And that's a powerful tool when you're trying to get people to talk. But as he started saying something about yeah, that was my plan and I didn't want to do it. Now he's trying to start shuffling and to protect himself from what's eventually going to get him locked up forever. And that's him and his brother both going against each other, I believe, if I recall correctly. And this cop's gotten him to a point of trust where he thinks that this cop believes what he's saying. So he's going to tell him whatever he want, whatever he thinks the cop will listen to. And uh, there's some emotional accessing and exasperation. Uh, I'll I'm going to just jump over a couple of these things. That shallow breathing and narrowing of the shoulders is the only reason I think this is getting to it. You see your shoulders get tighter and tighter and tighter and higher and higher. It, it's how turtling occurs. But in this case, I think it's just he's his rib cage is getting higher and higher. Um, I think up to now, up until we get into this, he has been in this place where he has this illusion that what he was doing is kind of cool. But he's bonded with this guy now. And now if this guy doesn't think it's cool, now there's a different thing. So whatever he brought to the equation that made him talk about this like it was just a normal thing is starting to fail a little bit. And we start to see breaking eye contact because I think he knows this detective isn't pleased with what he's saying, no matter how polite the detective is. And there's a there's a chance of being judged. And I think that's what we're seeing. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right, yeah, the kid closes off here and his head turtles down a little bit and he crosses his arm and he looks at the arms and he looks at the floor. Just I'm, I'm not going to repeat everything you were talking about there, though, Greg. But the detective is still playing this low aggression play with him. And you're right, and he's doing that because he can do that now without fear of being the kid pushing back because he's already bonded with him. And then when that woman starts, the woman detective starts a asking questions, that helps as well because you bring that female thing into it and you're dealing with a kid whose testosterone is probably through the roof. And so he he needs that motherly figure, which I don't think the the mother in his family obviously wasn't a, a big deal for her. It wasn't he wasn't attached to her very well? So I think that that light voice of uh, and it's it's not a um, it's not an aggressive voice at all as she's talking to him. So I think that that helps as well. And I think the, the the detective understands that too. I think she steps on him a little bit here in a few minutes, but but on this one she does. I think he was waiting for her to, her to jump in with whatever question was going to be. Um, but and let's remember this kid is talking about killing his entire family, but he's talking, he's, if you, if you watch this without the sound on you, you, you could, I could tell you, they're talking about this kid getting in trouble for stealing a bike. That's how unimportant the sound, how unstressed he is about that part of it. I think he's worried about what's going to happen to him because he doesn't know at, at this point, not that he cares. He, I think he's just wondering. So he's a little bit frustrated about that. So no emotions anything like that in there so so far from a layman's perspective it doesn't look like it like much is going on but from an interrogator's perspective when you see what's happening and i keep focusing on the same thing because i think he's doing such a good job of it this guy is so good at doing this so that that's where my uh my focus is because i'm so excited about that chase what do you got yeah i agree with you i don't know if y'all could hear my phone going off <clears throat> I had my mom on emergency bypass. She's asking if I can chat for a minute, and I had to respond to her. So, hey, mom, yeah. I'm filming a panel right now. <laughs> so, 
his when he's crossing his arms, one thing that I always look for is what I call digital flexion. So is the hand just relaxed on the arm or do you, are you seeing the fingers make indentions into the flesh, into the skin there? And so we're seeing a lot of tension in the hand. And his first large sign of hesitancy and stress here is to the question of his intent with stabbing Christopher. He's probably trying to minimize his motive and motivation. Everything else is pretty much the same. We're seeing great interrogation. We're seeing a stressed out kid who's unusually, absurdly calm. That's all. Yeah. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, what have I got? Um, well, it's nice how the interviewer here brings the subject into present tense and present tense feelings rather than how were you feeling at that time? How are you feeling now? The interviewer asks. Um, yeah, it'd be nice if the uh, if the subject had any feelings, but he doesn't have any feelings here. He's got no feelings. Uh, certainly, he, he isn't able to explain or talk about any of those feelings that he may have had at the time. Certainly not able to put them into a present tense. Uh, he just reiterates that he didn't want to do it. So he's back in, uh, in motive, in actions, and will not go to feelings. Now, is that because he doesn't have feelings or he wants to move away from feelings and into motive? Uh, both could be a both could be a possibility. Probably both are a possibility. Um, why lure them, says the interviewer. Now, I don't know what the subject says back. Can't tell what the subject is saying at all in that. I listened to it about 10 times. Have zero idea. Tried to find a transcript. Couldn't find one. So I don't know what he says. So so this may be more helpful for you if you know what he says. But what I see on after what he says is lip compression, including the chin, come right in. Like that, what's that mem where they put, you know, that dog doing that? Oh, as yeah. Well? My, I, I'm afraid my dog has been involved in a sex scandal. Yeah, basically he does. He does that gesture uh, exactly. He looks off. Uh, there's, there's then some asymmetry in the mouth as well, which can mean all kinds of possible things. It's not a good enough image for me to really see what's going on here, but ace, enough asymmetry for me to go, something's going on, something's going on there. And there's a single shoulder shrug on top of that as well. I wish I knew what he was saying at that point, but I don't. So go in there, see what he's saying. Uh, and and put down below what on earth he says at that point and subscribe at the same time. That'd be fantastic. You know, you guys had all these detailed plans. You had all the cool stuff to make it happen. Yeah. And it kind of started falling apart. And he said, like, it didn't go as planned. I think, I mean, did you kind of just freak out a little bit? Like, yeah, this is yeah. really happening? Well, I, I, I didn't know it was going to like. Yeah, you don't. But here's what's, here's what's getting me is like, it's crazy because you guys worked together and made all these plans and, you know, had it all figured out. And then when it happens, you're just kind of standing there not doing anything. And did you, did you decide like, Robert's going to kill everybody and I'm going to stand here and do nothing. So I better, I mean, did you? Is yeah, that... I think, I think that was my point. I was, I, I didn't want to kill anyone. Well, I, didn't want, I couldn't do it. So I just wanted to let him, but kill everyone. Yeah, but you stab somebody in the neck. No, I mean, I just kind of... Well, what I'm saying is, is it's not Robert's the one that should get all the credit here. I mean, for, I mean, um... Yeah. Well, because it's a big deal. I mean, you're going to be on the news. Um, you know what I mean? I don't, people are going to want to interview you. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to be interviewed. No, I'm not doing this. Well, but I'm just thinking... He does. Because you had said you had the plans, like, you're supposed to kill this person, yep. he's supposed to kill this person. Were you supposed to kill Christopher? Was he your responsibility? No. Um, it just worked out that way? Daniel was supposed to be his responsibility. I was okay. supposed to kill Dad. And it took hold of each other. But he had already basically done that. Yeah. So now you're left standing there. So were you trying to kill Christopher when you stabbed him in the neck? Were you just going to... I don't, I mean, I, I purposely missed the middle of the neck. I think I might have even hit him in the shoulder. I certainly didn't do it hard, but I don't know. Um. 
So, originally, your responsibility was... Victoria. Victoria. And Dad. And Dad. Yep, that's who I was supposed to take care of. Did you guys talk specifically? Because you said you said the crossbow, so you said... I mean, you guys had it planned, like, this is specifically how we're going to do it. Yeah, it was very specific, unfortunately, you know. I think he got his plan to move or something that doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Well, it was supposed to be a lot quicker and quieter, I guess. I mean... Did you say anything to Christopher? I didn't say anything. No. So, so you stabbed him. Now it's several hours later. How are you feeling? This whole thing... Like, film when you first step to get caught, I think it only lasts you about 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. But that was like, because it's, it's 8 o'clock in the morning now. So it's like eight hours ago. Yeah. So how do you feel now? I mean, I just kind of. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. I just to that. So you were saying you pleaded with. I guess when they were locked in the bathroom and what, we don't yeah, know the room um, were they locked in? Uh, the bathroom and they were right next to it is um, my dad's office, stand the locked in the dad's office. Is it just one door to get into the bathroom and the office? No, they were right, two doors right next to each other. Right next to like this? Basically. Like, you know, like this. In the corner? Yeah, kind of. And, um, and I was like, I said, help Robert said to me and they both opened up. In which room did you go in? I went into the bathroom, just, you know, I stabbed Christopher. Okay. But then the way, did Robert go? Robert well, we went into the uh, office where Daniel was stabbed, and Daniel ran off and they came into the bathroom and started stabbing Christopher. I left. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, I guess where I'm kind of confused is if you didn't want this anymore and you didn't want this to go down this way, why calling them into opening the doors and letting this okay. continue? I was trying to help Robert. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. All right, Chase, what do you got? So he's in uh, fight or flight during his recall, and when he's asked to process how he's feeling, how he's feeling... His only concern, uh, I think, here is protecting himself. The behaviors here are the same we see in all examples of fight or flight response. So it's not a huge difference there. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. I, again, it's another great example of the detective matching the emotion of the kid. And at the very end, the kid sighs and he sighs to, and looks down, and the de detective sighs in the same way. So I thought that was brilliant the way he's doing it. And he's doing exactly emotionally, from an emotional standpoint, what the kid's doing. So at the same time, at the end, the kid is, is looking at, at both the, the, detec the guy detective and the woman detective. And he's, these are confirmation glances just to make sure that they're, they're interconnected to see what they're thinking, you know, sort of check in and see how things are going. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so as we've been saying throughout, he, he's n never at any point suggesting he wasn't involved. He's trying to minimize the extent to which he's involved. I'm not entirely sure why. I think the the uh, interviewer asked him later on, does he think that'll you know be better for him if he was involved less in some way the body count was less for him uh but 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 clearly it's something he wants to do uh, he says i just told him three i think the three is referring to the amount of people he may or may not have been involved with and on that we get a heavy breath out we get a look away so an an, an eye block to some extent we get this release of tension in the hole of the head, which then doesn't stabilize. So this little kind of wobble at the end. And then he gives a look around as well. That could be another release of tension, but I think it's probably a threat check uh, at that, you know, or possibly uh, both or, an, uh, or, or a threat check excused as, as releasing tension. But certainly there's a, a big deviation from his usual nonchalant baseline on, I just told him, three and this number being uh important look this doesn't really tell you anything interesting or new about this case but it does tell you to look out for 
you know, clusters of very different behavior or one piece of very different behavior around some specific item or specific word. And I think there's a, a really good clear, because he has got this incredible baseline of, of apathy around, around the event, but on the number, how many he's involved with, plus or minus three, there, there's a big baseline change. And that's interesting. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Or somebody Greg. else. Greg, yeah, what yeah. You, I'll get there in the end. Greg, what do you got on this one? Did you yeah, not sleep I, either last night, Mark? I, no, I think all of us are there from this weekend. But <laughs> Man, yeah. yeah Chase, I agree. You get to see some fight or flight in here. And I think the genesis of that fight or flight is that this cop that he is now bonded to is starting to poke and prod. So we see him, his respiration rise up into his upper chest. And we see him then blow out that CO2, those things we were talking about. He's also, I think, this is my opinion, that he's exhibiting some shame when the guy asks a hard question he tucks his chin and looks away breaks eye contact and checks back for confirmation or whatever he's doing where there's threat or confirmation and he doesn't the reason i point that out is because when the woman asks a question that all disappears and he looks right at her when he's answering a question so i think this guy has done such a good job of bonding to him that it's hard for him to look him in the eye when he's saying i killed three which is very different than when he first came in the room when he was happy to say i did this i did that i did this so when we're paying attention, this is what I love about this this short clip is this is a great example of this detective syncing with this kid, regardless of whether he knows he's the, his opponent or not. There, he's gotten into his head to a place that this guy's feeling some remorse or some guilt for having to tell him this stuff. I don't think he feels any remorse for killing the people. I think he doesn't want this guy to judge him. And that's masterful interrogation. It's all I got. Good catch. How about explaining this? You know what? <clears throat> Unexplainable. That's. Let me tell you something. Here's something I saw Spidey do. He does it all the time, like he's on stage. He does this thing where he grabs his his. He'll grab his thumb, and and somehow gets a hold of it. And he does this, and he damn pulls his thumb off and pulls it all the way to the end of his hand. I've never seen anything like it before in my life. But we'll ask him to do it. He does this thing where he grabs his thumb, he pulls it down, then pulls it back. I don't know how he does it. Cool. He does it all the time. Voodoo. It's voodoo magic. Yeah, he loves it. Did you say anything to Christopher? I just you know. So so you stabbed him. Now it's several hours later. How are you feeling? This whole thing, like feeling when you first step to getting caught, I think it only lasts you about thirty minutes. Yeah. Yeah. But that was like because it's it's eight o'clock in the morning now. So it's like eight hours ago. Yeah. So how do you feel now? I mean, I just kind of. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. I just ran into that. So you were saying you pleaded with, I guess, when they were locked in the bathroom and what we don't know yeah. the room where they locked in. Oh, uh, the bathroom and they were. Right next to it is um, my dad's office, Dan locked himself in his office. Is it just one door to get into the bathroom and the office? No, they're right. Two doors got next to each other. Right next, like this? Basically. Like, you know, like this. In the corner, yeah, kind of. And, um, and I was like, I said, hello, Rob, what's up to me? And they both opened up. And which room did you go in? I went into the bathroom, just near my dad's Christopher. Okay. But then what did Robert go Robert in? Robert went in to the uh, office where Daniel was stabbed and Daniel ran off and they came into the bathroom and started stabbing Christopher. I left. Um, yeah. Okay. So, I guess where I'm kind of confused is if you didn't want this anymore and you didn't want this to go down this way, why con them into opening the doors and letting this I continue? I was trying to help Robert. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's a problem that we might have, and, and I don't want it to be an issue for you because you've been really cooperative. Um, you know, we're going to talk to Robert too, so he's going to give us his version of the story, and you know, sometimes they're going to be different. So, um, is there anything that you kind of didn't quite 
tell me Ryan or you changed a little bit and now that you understand that Robert's going to tell me everything. Um, I, yeah. but, um, he'll probably tell you exactly who the gig has been because that's why I told him, you know, when we were sitting out in the woods you know, to make conversation. But, you know, for instance, I'll show you how they up Christopher. What three? What do you mean you told him? So you told him that you killed three people? Yeah, I told him because he asked me how many did you get. I said three. Did you tell him who you got? No, I just said three. So do you, I, I guess this is my question for you, do you think it's a lesser sentence if you killed one or if you killed three? No. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? So they do a good, a good bait question, or we know all if you're talking about shark for the same way. And, and I love, is there anything, is my note, is there anything? If you're sitting in an interrogation room, if you hear, is there any reason, is there, is there... You should already know you're being set up. That is a setup. And in the not in the intelligence side, we would call that we know all. Hey, we know something you don't know we know, and we're going to see if you'll play with it. And that's where we go. He also tries, then this kid tries to do um, trading guilt. I'm going to tell you that I lied about how many people I killed to my brother. Although we know he killed one. He's already admitted I killed one person, one of my family members. But I lied to him about three. That's a trading guilt thing I always talk about where a person will try to throw out something so you'll leave him alone about something else. There's throat protection and eye avoidance after he said, I said I got three. And then that lip compression, Mark, the one you're talking about with the dogs, I, my opinion is what he's doing here is that's resolution to the issue. He's just gotten to a point where I'm resolved to it. This is the way it is. And I think that's what we see a lot of times in these people. Like we saw Bill Clinton, we saw Anthony Weiner, we saw list the guys here that are on that picture. They do that once they're busted. I think it's unresolved to the issues. I'll leave it with that. Chase, what do you got? The uh, one big thing here that I'll point out, and this is not a not a dig on them at all, but you you should never never mention sentencing inside of an interrogation room as an interrogator. You shouldn't be talking about that. That puts somebody in what's called long-term thinking and consequential thinking. We want them in short-term impulsive mode in there. And that's our job as interrogators is to keep them in short-term thinking. And this facial touching is really this kid's tell for deception. He's done it several times. And each time he's done it, there is a proven lie that immediately follows this, uh, this facial touching. And it, is anyone else, I don't know if y'all heard it, how he's pronouncing three here. He pronounces the word three, three different ways in here. And it's so hard to hear throughout this whole thing that I just skipped over a third of these videos because I couldn't understand him. Then there's deception here with describing the number to his brother. There's lip compression. There's this large inhale. There's a confirmation glance where he's checking to make sure that he's being believed. There's a giant head movement. Scott's getting up and leaving. There's exit checking. <laughs> then there's a second confirmation glance. So that's a huge, uh, besides Scott leaving, that is a, a huge mountain of deception indicators. Scott, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I thought somebody was trying to get in. It was Hattie. Sorry, she was scratching. <laughs> I couldn't, with these, I can't hear. I was like, what the? I couldn't tell what was happening. I'm so sorry. No sorry. worries. What do you got? Um, <laughs> okay uh this is where the kid's body language really ramps up he's got a lot of stuff going on here like we were talking about he's got mouth grooming going on his breath rate grows goes up he's goofing around his nose he's rubbing his hands his cadence speeds up uh, a couple of deep breaths and this is all based around that qu the the question there and i think you're right chase I think she's that she sort of stepped stepped on it there a little bit you know i don't know what the i couldn't figure out what the reasoning for that would be when she did that um but the detective is right there with him, matching his body language of, of stress, uh, anxiety, and apprehension, Greg. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I've only got one thing on this, which is like the rest of you. can't, for the life of me, hear what the kid's saying. I have zero idea. And so I was trying to work out, I was just checking my phone there, because I was trying to work out who it reminded me of, and then it came up. Uh, there's a Dick Tracy character called Mumbles, Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. And there's a, in the film of it, Dustin Hoffman uh, plays him and does just a, a, a brilliant job. So, uh, 
you know, don't don't leave the show now because there's more to come. But after the show, once you've subscribed and all the usual stuff, uh, go and check out Mumbles uh, on uh, from Dick Tracy. Very funny and very similar to the uh, the murderer that we have uh, here. Uh, let's have another video. You know Sorry, what was work. missing here? For interrogation purposes, what Diction. was missing here is emphasizing the truth and why this happened. Uh, I think they would have gotten really far just going along those two venues. Like, I, I, we know what happened. We know, you know, there's multiple people. We know it's a little more than you're saying. I want to figure out why first. Like, what what is the meaning behind all this? And start dragging that out, drag that out of a 16-year-old, get him to try to build rapport back with the interrogator. I think that would have been fantastic. And well, keep in mind. Because, because they he positioned why earlier on, which is it isn't society, it's about numbers. So they've kind of, they've spent that ultimately. And, oh, and no. spent it by, well, I mean, they, 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 if that was a question that they've got, they spent that question uh, early on and suggested exactly what the motive was. Yeah, yeah. I think they are working brother against brother at the same time too. And they probably are, fee they're probably getting feed, you know, hey, what do you need from me? What do you need from, me? so I think you're right, Chase, you can get a lot out of it. The other thing, I've read that there were cameras in the house associated with the alarm. So his father, I think, was an IT guy and had a whole bunch of stuff tied in. So they probably have all the evidence in the world. I don't, I don't mm. know. But, yeah, I agree with you. You could get more out of him if you ask why. Because any, But these, I don't know. These kids have that density. Did you, any of you guys think he might have repeated that word three different ways because he's uncomfortable with how he speaks? Chase, because I, I wondered the same thing. He'll be. Yeah, I just think he's that's part of deception. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so here's a problem that we might have, and, and I don't want it to be an issue for you because you've been really cooperative. Um, you know, we're going to talk to Robert, too. So he's going to give us his version of the story. And, you know, sometimes they're going to be different. So... Um, is there anything that you kind of didn't quite tell me right or you changed a little bit and now that you understand that Robert's going to tell me everything? I, 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 um, he'll probably tell you that he'll forgive them because that's why I told him, you know, when you're sitting out in the woods, you know, to make conversation, but, you know, for instance, I'll show you how to Christopher. What three... What do you mean you told him? So you told him that you killed three people? Yeah, I told him, because he asked me how many did you get. I said three. Did you tell him who you bought? No, I just said three. Um. So do you... I, I guess this is my question for you. Do you think it's a lesser sentence if you killed one or if you killed three? No. What, I mean, I don't know. I I think Robert, he may have, there's going to be a lot of differences. That's what I'm concerned about. And we don't want you to come off as a liar. I mean, because you've been real cooperative. You seem like a really good kid. You know, you graduated high school early. Um, you're designing games. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you got going on. And so I don't want people to get a bad opinion of you and think that you're the type of guy that lies to police when it's kind of caught. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so tell me, I know that you're leaving something out. There's, I mean, because it, it's like she said, um, you know, you're, this isn't like you stole a bicycle. You know, this is the most you can do. But, you know, so it's a big deal. Um, but a lot of people, when they talk and think about this thing, your honesty is a big deal and how you handle yourself from here on out. And if you come off, because to me, you don't seem like a bad guy. You know, like, you don't scare me. I, I mean, I never, never thought you would have done this. So you just seem like a normal kid to me. And you seem like an honest kid. But see, I talk to people all the time. And I mean, I, I know when people are lying or when, when I'm not quite getting the whole story. And so I just want to catch you before you get in that bad spot where people start saying you're a bad guy, you're evil, you're a liar. So just tell me what I'm missing. Um, I mean, along with the do thing, I was uh, going to get on to 
like convincing the people who were still alive that like I was on the side and I called the police, you know, so they would like stay and I would get them. So they'd kind of stay on the ground and he'd, he'd be able to come stab them again. Yeah. Did you ever have to um, <clears throat> go get Robert to let him know someone was still making too much noise or anything? No, no, it was his, uh, he was chaotic. He was just going from person to person. So what kind of things did you say to them? Uh, but uh, the only things I uh, said to them was when I was trying to convince them that I was with them so they would, you know, come to me and could kill them. Okay. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, uh, he says, you're leaving something out and there's a, a big breath in and then a puff out of the cheeks there, which can often mean somebody doesn't quite know where to go next. Like, what do I do? You know, they're a bit stumped. Where do I go next with this? Um, now, he then goes into, you don't seem like a bad kid. You're a normal kid. Uh, just so you know, I really don't think anybody in that room, other than maybe the kid, thinks <laughs> that he's he's not a bad kid and he's a normal uh, kid. This is just a show that they're making in order to win that person over to minimise that. Minimise it to the extent that yeah, this is, we think this is very normal not to, you know, like your mum and dad too much or or the rest of it, and, you know, want to count bodies. You know, you're a good, you're a good kid. They don't think that. They're trying to win across um, uh, the, the subject to them. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, this is a beautiful, beautiful, subtle example of pressure. And this is real pressure. And if you're not in that room and you're not feeling what this kid's feeling, you're not feeling what it, where it's headed. So this is trading guilt in reverse, you might say. But I'll, I'll tell you what it really is. He's saying, hey, we already know you're a murderer. You won't lie right at that. And it seems like, okay, that's trading guilt in reverse. But what that really is, is something I call personal extinction and always have. If I can figure out what four things make you who you are, and I take all of them away except for one, and I go, nah, 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 nah. guess what? You'll start to feel like you need to say something. And it works wonderfully in many, many instances. A lot of people who do horrible things in the name of a cause will s stand up all day and say, I'm no liar. And if you can put them on the call for a liar, then you've got them. If you put them on the, on the map for a liar, then you've got them. And he's doing a really good but subtle job of doing it. And Usually the perpetrator, this guy, is going to go the other way. You heard him do it earlier. I lied, but I didn't kill. He's doing it this way, saying, I know you killed, so so what? And if you don't believe it, see the respiration increase, all of it rise up to his upper lungs again. When he gets to the fact it's not like a bike, that respiration is shallow, and you can hear those CO2 XLs that we're always talking about. He does a great job of compounding the trust and getting this guy to listen to him. And, Scott, you talked about it earlier, but if you really want to know what this guy's doing, listen to this video. Because his vocals are slowed, his cadence is slowed, his volume is lower, you know, consistent tone and pitch is a beautiful thing. He, look, I, I don't think there's any one of the videos we've seen yet that is as subtle as this, but as powerful as this one. You see the kid's cadence of his movement start to glitch. And you can also then see uh, he's protective of his words, and you see his head shake and pause before he says anything. I think he's now shielding whatever he says, and everything is deviation from baseline. And I think it's only directed at this guy. If the woman were to ask another question right here, I think we'd get a different response. And I think they're smart enough. And Chase, maybe maybe it was intentional for her to come at him. I don't know with that sentencing question to push him back into this into this guy's um, into this guy's grasp. But yeah, I think it's this is a really good one, Scott. What do you got? All right, yeah, again, I think this is a great example of building this kid's ego up and telling him he's a good kid and he's not like his brother. And that telling him telling the truth is going to show everybody that that he's he's not like his brother. He's not, he's not the most evil of the two. So I think and I think he executed that beautifully as he when he, when he did that cuz the kid is right there with him. And this whole time he's built up that rapport, he's built up that connection, he's built up the kid creating a relationship with him. So now he's got him right where he wants him. You know, he's got him to, to, to even when the smallest little things, glitches come up, he can talk to him and ask him about him and he'll, he'll give them to him. And he, he delivers that so well. And this is different from my all time favorite interrogation that Jim Smith did with Russell Williams. <clears throat> this, this kid isn't a full blown psychopath. 
this is one of those cases where the the emotions were weren't developed as a child in my opinion now this is this is just my opinion um because you've got two different kinds of things people call like you were talking about earlier chase people call them both uh, psychopaths and it's a person who is born that way you have the nature versus nurture concept where the person is born and their amygdala don't work properly i know i'm all the time talking about this so i'll make it short but the amygdala is part of the limbic system and that helps you have empathy for other people it gives you or enables you to have empathy for other people not just sympathy but feel the way they feel so I, I, this kid may have a hint of that i can't tell but we are seeing spots of him talking uh, from an emotional place so i don't I, I really don't think the kid's a he's acting psychopathic his actions are he's a psychopathic killer but he did. I don't believe he's a psychopath. I think his is his is nature or nurture. He was raised that way. His emotions weren't. Nobody said to him, "Oh, don't hurt that little dog because you know it'll hurt him." Don't pull his foot that way or his tail because it hurts. And never gave him examples. Maybe they're mean to him all the time, beat him all the time, or something. That's usually what we see in the uh, nurture part is where the father or the mother is an alcoholic and they shut him down all the time, like like apparently that we know about this kid. So I think that's what's happened here. We're not looking at a, at a true psych, the clinical psychopath. We're looking at somebody who is who is uh, acting as a say, you know, has psychopathic um, actions. In other words, I guess you'd say. So even though the crime was horrifying, we're seeing enough of the emotions, uh, hints of emotion in there to make me feel he's not a psychopath, but he's riding that fine line that everybody looks at and goes, "Oh, I know exactly what that is because he did this. He is that." No, that's that's. I don't think he was born a psychopath. Um, who is it, Chase? Yeah, okay. I think the police uh, interrogator here did a great job. Uh, one way that in the future this could be done differently, and one way that I teach is when we're talking about like there's some information left out here. I distance that from that person. I don't say you left something out or you are going to be seen as a liar. I don't do that initially. So I'll first start by removing it and I'll say something and I'll trigger him with what he wants. And I'll say, you know, there's so many people out there that want to be remembered as an action taker, but they're forgotten as a liar. So I'm, I'm triggering everything that he wants to be, he wants to be remembered and lying equals forgetting. Like everybody forgets who you are. So I would definitely come up with that. But what the interrogator is doing here is called a, in in the Reed Technique School of Thought, it's called a strong, positive confrontation, and that's what's going on here. That's when an interrogation, you hear somebody go, you know, John, I like you as a person. I think you're a good guy, but I've been doing this for a long time, and if there's one thing I know, it's when I'm not getting the full story. And that's what's going on. That's kind of the textbook script of what that means there. And uh, mostly the same stuff here on the kid's side. Don't want to waste your time. I think Robert, he may have, there's going to be a lot of differences. That's what I'm concerned about. And we don't want you to come off as a liar. I mean, because you've been real cooperative. You seem like a really good kid. You know, you graduated high school early. Um, you're designing games. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you got going on. And so I don't want people to get a bad opinion of you and think that you're the type of guy that lies to police when it's kind of caught. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so tell me, I know that you're leaving something out. There's, I mean, because it, it's like she said, um, you know, you're, this isn't like you stole a bicycle. You know, this is the most you can do, but, you know. So it's a big deal. Um, but a lot of people, when they talk and think about this thing, your honesty is a big deal and how you handle yourself from here on out. And if you come off, because because to me, you don't seem like a bad guy. You know, like, you don't scare me. I, I mean, I never, never thought you would have done this. So you just seem like a normal kid to me. And you seem like an honest kid. But see, I talk to people all the time. And I mean, I, I know when people are lying or when when I'm not quite getting the whole story. And so I just want to, 
catch you before you get in that bad spot where people start saying you're a bad guy, you're evil, you're a liar. So just tell me what I'm missing. Oh, I mean, along the to-do thing, I was uh, going around to like convincing the people who were still alive that like I was on the side. I called the police, you know, so they would like stay and I would get them. So they kind of stay on the ground, and he he'd be able to come stab him again. Yeah. Did you ever have to um, <clears throat> go get Robert to let him know someone was still making too much noise or anything? No, no, this is uh, he chaotic. He was just going from person to person. So what yeah. kind of things did you say to them? Uh, but, uh, the only things I uh, said to them was when I was trying to convince them that I was with them so they would, you know, come to me and could kill them. Okay. Well, uh, I was right. The guys that are interviewing Robert um, kind of gave me a quick version of what he's saying that you did. Yeah. And, and you haven't told me everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know you're not being completely honest, and I, I gave you one shot already. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what you might say. I mean, I don't know. Well, you stabbed more than one person. So who else did you stab? Same. Or you stabbed more than just one time? Oh, I stabbed Christopher more than one time. How many times did you stab him? I think twice. Because you don't think we're going to know that? Stop I thinking know. and go with what you know. You mentioned forensics a minute ago. I know. I mean, I'm, I'm just one of like hundreds of people that are going to look at this thing, okay? I know. I mean, we got, we got the state police coming in. Uh, there's, I don't know, 20 different forensic detectives at your house right now. Um, They're going to be there a long time because of the scene that it is. So everybody that you killed and every single stab wound that you inflicted, we're going to know about. And this is your last chance to just kind of let us know, to be honest, to man up and, and tell us exactly what she did and, and start making it right. I hit Christopher. I did not stab Victoria with Daniel. You did not stab them. Yeah, 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 I, um, I tried to stab them. You stabbed them off. Yeah, I got yeah, yeah, it. When she was walking away, I tried to go for the night, but, you know, I... Is that when you cut yourself, then? Yeah, I think I'd have to do that. Where did you stab her? I tried to go from behind the car, go by the Did you cut her? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, this doesn't seem like something you have to think about. I know it's, it's, I, you're still kind of dealing with it. Um. And I wasn't there, I wasn't the one doing it. But you don't have to think about it. You know what you did. So you, you cut her neck, you stabbed Christopher in the neck. How many times did you stab Christopher? Two or three, I think. And who else did you stab? Besides Mom. Because here's the thing, everybody's been stabbed. And you both had knives, and we know you both stabbed everybody. So you guys are kind of at the same level, and so now it's, Who's going to be honest and make this right? And who's a liar? Okay, which one do you want to be? I'm not. Okay, so you're a man of your word? Yes. Okay. And do you want to make this right and do the right thing at this point in time? Yes. Okay. What else okay. are you missing? You want to start over then? I'm lying. You, you tell us where you need to start. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, there we go again. There's that resolve to it, lip compression, and a quick nod of confirmation. Yeah, I think he's, that's where he's using it. There's a respiration increase, and his sentence structure is gone. Chase, you were talking about earlier, his pronunciation, we all said his pronunciation is bad, but his sentence structure disappears. And I think if you leave a guy alone, which they did just before this, they walked out for a couple of minutes, the person's head does all the work. When he's asked them, when he's asking who else, Watch his head jerk around like a squirrel in the road. And then he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I stabbed mom. Like he just forgot that he stabbed mom. This guy sets the hook. I think we're running here. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think he responds here to the perception of being a man of your word. So he doesn't want to be perceived as a liar. It's very interesting where he's playing this moral dignity of telling the truth against the moral indignity of multiple killings, that somebody who would kill so many people and the indignity of that, he would actually move towards the idea of wanting to be seen as somebody who tells the truth. He does respond to this. So 
he's he has a nature of of i guess being self-centered rather than um uh social so he, clearly he, he has behaviors which are antisocial here doesn't mind killing people does mind being seen as a liar uh scott what do you got all right, this is where the or everything changes for the the detective. He comes in from talking to the other detectives, and he's a little bit worked up. So he knows that aggression is not going to work with a kid being being too aggressive um, from an adult. The aggression from an adult. So he kind of tampers that down, but he tries to keep the rapport alive. And he gets to get the question about the kid being honest. He has to tell him that he cares and he doesn't think want anybody to think he's a bad guy. And that's that's why he asks if he's a man of his word. So you're talking to a kid, but ask him if he's a man of his word. So you, as the adult, he's saying, "You're a man, and you know, are you a man of your uh, of your word?" Um, so I, th I think that's what's going on there. That they built that that rapport together. The kids looking up to him at this point because it's probably the the first adult in a long time that's been nice to him and tried to connect with him. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I got it all. Well, uh, I was right. The guys that are interviewing Robert um, kind of gave me a quick version of what he's saying that you did. Yeah. And, and you haven't told me everything, okay? So I know you're not being completely honest, and uh, I gave you one shot already. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what you might say. I mean, I don't know. Well, you stabbed more than one person. So who else did you stab? Same. Or you stabbed more than just one time? Oh, I stabbed Christopher more than one time. How many times did you stab him? I think twice. Because you don't think we're going to know that? Stop I, thinking I and go with what you know. You mentioned forensics a minute ago. I know. I mean, I'm, I'm just one of, like, hundreds of people that are going to look at this thing, okay? I know. I mean, we got, we got the state police coming in. Uh, there's, I don't know, 20 different forensic detectives at your house right now. Um, They're going to be there a long time because of the scene that it is. So everybody that you killed and every single stab wound that you inflicted, we're going to know about. And this is your last chance to just kind of let us know, to be honest, to man up and, and tell us exactly what you did and, and start making it right. I hit Christopher. I did not stab Victoria with Daniel. You did not stab the Yeah, yeah, I, I um, I tried to stab mom. You stabbed mom. I took, yeah, I got when she was walking away. I tried to go for a night, but you know. I, Is that when you cut yourself? Then? Yeah, I think I'd have to do that. Where did you stab her? I tried kind of to go from behind it. Did you cut her? I think so. Yeah. I think you know, this doesn't seem like something you have to think about. I know it's it's I, you're still kind of dealing with it. Um. And I wasn't there, I wasn't the one doing it. But you don't have to think about it. You know what you did. So you, you cut her neck, you stabbed Christopher in the neck. How many times did you stab Christopher? Two or three, I think. And who else did you stab? Besides mom. Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing, everybody's been stabbed. And you both had knives, and we know you both stabbed everybody. So you guys are kind of at the same level, and so now it's, Who's going to be honest and make this right? And who's a liar? Okay, which one do you want to be? I'm not. Okay, so you're a man of your word? Yes. Okay. And do you want to make this right and do the right thing at this point in time? Yes. Okay. What else okay. are you missing? You want to start over then? I'm like, you, you tell us where you need to start. He stabs. I didn't stab. And so we only stabbed, you only stabbed the, your family because they were in the way not, towards the bigger plan? Um, not, well, the reason we, we was trying to kill the family is uh -huh. um, they were in the way and they had you know, high account. Just to start off with a big count. So, um, so is this all a game? Um, this higher count, um, can you, is this a game? It's a, well, like it's kind of become famous and get, you know, set a record. Did you, now, because you said, you said this yourself, 
you've told Robert you killed three. And so now we're stuck at the point where you've told us you stabbed Christopher and your mother. Is there one more person that you stabbed and, and you didn't mention earlier? I, I can stick to my one that I, I had stabbed anybody else, but this one wasn't. How do, you, how do you feel about what you've done now? I, I didn't like it the minute it started. One time I mean, how do you feel about your mother? I mean, you, I mean she, you watched her get stabbed, you, you cut her throat yourself, and you watched her bleed all over the place and scream. How does that make you feel? You don't want to think about it. And Christopher, your little brother, I mean, you stabbed him in the neck. What, is, what has he ever done to you? So he's just a number. Yes. And how does it, I mean, how do you feel about that now? It's pointless. It's what? Pointless. Pointless. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Uh, go ahead and skip me. I'm going to skip this one. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I think this is interesting for one reason. There's a motive there. Uh, it's pointless. There's a nihilistic motive. It's pointless. That is, you know, I guess a, 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 a current and modern trope of why people might do some of these mass killings. An idea of, look, it's it's the whole of life is pointless, so why wouldn't you? It's it's absurd. The belief that life is meaningless, not that that's absurd. Uh, the, the belief that life is meaningless is called absurdism. Like who can, you know, who can make any head or tail of it? So I would just suggest all of us, we always need to help people in some way understand that there might be meaning to stuff, whatever that meaning might be. And if you dismantle meaning, if you dismantle values, that, that's okay to dismantle them, but you have to put something else there instead. Because if there are no, I don't care what the values are. I mean, I might, right. if your values come up against my values of my family. Yeah. But ultimately, the real problem is when there is absolutely no meaning and everything is valueless, because then why wouldn't you just do something like that? If you destroy values, you must replace them with something. Greg, what do you got on this one? You're back to microculture. Him and his brother have been in this dance of stupidity for however long, we don't know. We don't know what kind of influence they had from outside through the internet or what parenting, because we can't speak to that. But they have married themselves to an idea that everything is pointless and so they can do anything they want. And that is cult-like when you are repeating to each other and there's no outside influence and they have devolved to this. Here's the interesting piece in this video for me. If you're not sure what's going on, listen to that CO2 release. Watch him start to rock and distance from her. Her She gave him the answer, and he distances and repeats it. He suddenly realizes this guy is now judgmental, and this guy is judging him for all the things he's done, and he starts trying to accommodate the guy. That pointless word, Mark, was his brother's word from the very beginning of this whole thing. So he's come full circle, and now he's back to that respiration, back to that lockdown piece. I think what we're seeing here is what he would have been when he walked in the door in the very beginning if this detective had not been masterful at getting him to talk. Now, did he find out anything that he didn't know? Don't know. But what he did do is effectively manage this kid to the point this kid opened up and started to talk. Scott, what do you got? You guys literally covered all the points and it was all about being pointless that I had and that part there, Greg, about that. So let's move on. And so we only stopped, you only stopped the, your family because they were in the way uh, uh, towards the bigger plan. Um, uh, well, the reason we, we was kind of killed family is uh -huh. um, they were in the way and they um, you know, how you count. Just to start off with a big count. So, um, so is this all a game? I mean, this higher count, I mean, you, is this a game? It's a, more like to kind of become famous and get, you know, set a record. Did you, now, because you said, you said this yourself, you told Robert you killed three. Yeah. And so now we're stuck at the point where you've told us you stabbed Christopher and your mother. Mm -hmm. Is there one more person that you stabbed and, and you didn't mention earlier? Okay. I, I can stick to my one that I, I had stabbed anybody else, but this one wasn't. 
How do you, how do you feel about what you've done now? I, I didn't like it the minute it started. I mean, how do you feel about your mother? I mean, you, I mean, she, you watched her get stabbed. You, you cut her throat yourself, and you watched her bleed all over the place and scream. How does that make you feel? You don't want to think about it. And Christopher, your little brother, I mean, you stabbed him in the neck. What, is, what has he ever done to you? So he's just a number. Yes. And how does, I mean, how do you feel about that now? It's pointless. It's what? Pointless. Pointless. All right, well, we've watched all these videos and we've all come up with a verdict. Mark, what's yours? Yeah, there's some great moments here where he moves out of this nonchalant baseline. It was great to see those. I'm just going to reiterate again, if you remove values, I don't really care what values you put into place. Well, I do if they're going to come up against my values, but ultimately you have to replace them with something. If you don't, you're going to have a big problem. Chase. Yeah, we're seeing a mixture of nihilism, loneliness, and testosterone. Greg? Yeah, we're seeing two microcultures play out. The one of insanity between the two brothers who thought everything was okay and pointless and you could do anything you want without enough guidance and influence. And we're seeing a developed microculture by a masterful interrogator who creates a microculture in front of your very eyes for a very short period of time and then turns on the other guy and the other guy can't see it coming. Scott, what do you got? I agree with all you guys. I think you could put this interrogator in the room with anybody, anybody, in about 20 minutes. They're going to think they've made a friend for life, one of those guys, whether he likes yeah. that person or not, no matter what they've done, as in this case, one of the most horrifying things you can possibly do is kill your family. And this guy makes friends with him. This guy has this kid believing that they've connected in their friends. That was incredible. And he deserves credit out the wazoo for that. I think it was fantastic. All right, fellas, thanks for another good one, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?